Yeah, th thanks a lot. Definitely, ChatGPT is one of the best buzzwords if you want to apply for this kind of conference. I'm so excited to see uh, what next year is going to bring. Uh, but let's just focus on large language models for those 30 or 40 minutes and see uh, whether they are really useful or is it still just a toy that we could play a bit with, but nothing really else. Because uh, we have all seen uh, that uh, large language models, including ChatGPT, uh, were not only used by people working in tech, such as you, but also by, by the traditional media, some journalists. So that's definitely a topic that will be hot in the upcoming months. And there are probably more and more uh, use cases for it. But we also need to be, be sure that there are some limits and that there are some ways of how to overcome, it, overcome them. But the main issue that we have with, uh, with chat GPT-like models is the fact that they produce some uh, responses which may sound reasonable at the first glance, but it turns to be, they, they turn to be uh, counterfactual. I tried with asking ChatGPT, it is ChatGPT version 3 because it is becoming more and more uh, complicated to find like a good example that would be completely against the common knowledge. I just asked for the previous capital of Germany. And for those who are not German, that may sound like a reasonable response, right? Frankfurt could have been a previous capital of, of Germany, why not? But it turns out to be, uh, to be false because Bonn was actually the, the uh, previous capital of uh, West Germany, at least, because Germany was divided into West and East part. So that's basically like a simple case where, at, in which uh, ChatGPT failed to answer correctly to, to given prompt. Uh, but that's actually the, the fact that I was able to get uh, from Google uh, just by providing a simple query. Uh, so this is basically something that our model should have been exposed to during the training phase because that's how those uh, large language models are being trained. Uh, but this is also something that uh, it couldn't remember properly for some reasons. And this is... Yeah, but that should be also like the correct answer to, to my prompt. But okay, uh, I could accept that it, it may be just simply wrong, but it will be way better if it could just simply provide me the, the answer that I don't know, or I'm not sure, I do not have that information. And this is something that we call hallucination. And hallucination is a response of large language model, which is not uh, justified by the, by the data that it was trained on. Uh, so this is basically a case that we really need to avoid, uh, but we have no idea of how to do that yet. We need to focus a bit on the training process because that's the reason uh, why those large language models tend to confabulate. And this is basically a screenshot from a great talk by Andre Carpati. This is a state of GPT that has been released recently. And that describes the whole process of training GPT-like models. Uh, so the, the first part, the pre-training, is something that is like the most important piece here because it's being done on some huge corpora of uh, language textual data that is being scraped from internet. Uh, well, people used to say that uh, we are training those models on whole internet, but that's not exactly the case because we are using, they are using some uh, sort of publicly available data sets like Common Crawl. Uh, this presentation also uh, links to some, uh, some data sets which has been uh, used to train at least some of those. And basically, as you may see, they are using trillions of, uh, of words uh, to train the pre-model pre that is being used as a base for some further fine-tuning. And that's one of the reasons. We are taking the data of a low quality. Uh, well, my mom used to say that I should be reading books instead of uh, looking at my computer and reading the internet, and she was right about that. And probably we should do the same uh, for training models if we really care about the, uh, the quality of the data that we put into. Uh, well, any single book, at least those better ones, let's say, uh, may go through, uh, should go through the, some sort of review process. So 
we can expect that the information that is being put inside a, a, a particular book should be uh, at least confirmed by somebody else, not only the author. Uh, so that's, that would be definitely a better data set to train some general language, uh, general usage language models, because they would rely on some uh, factual information, not something that somebody decided to put into the internet into the internet. But that's actually something that we need to do because it's just way easier. Um, and this is basically um, a network that is being trained to predict the next token, but nothing really else. This base model is then being used in some further fine tuning. So then we are using uh, less data, but of a higher quality. And that's actually where it learns some uh, to, to, to really work for some, uh, for some specific cases. We have the supervised fine-tuning uh, phase. Then our model can be also fine-tuned even further We're, uh, with some additional model in that process. Like we can create a reward modeling uh, system that would be ranking the, the responses returned by the system. Actually, this is Pretty complicated process, but this, this presentation uh, is uh, available. So if you are interested in more details, uh, please just uh, watch it carefully, because that, that shares a lot of, a lot of uh, cool things about the training process of, of this kind of models. But there are actually like uh, three different models that we could deploy. Actually, you can create a large language model based on this publicly available huge amount of data. And it will be also working pretty well for some cases. But if you put garbage in, you can expect garbage out. And that's exactly uh, what happens with large language models. Uh, the answers that are provided based on our prompts or queries uh, may sound reasonable, but they are just uh, predicting some next tokens based on the, on the prompt and the rules or knowledge they, uh, they uh, learned while uh, during the training phase. So that's exactly the, the whole objective of the training, and that's what those uh, networks also do during the inference. There are two components which are included into the prediction. The first one uh, is the internal state of such a network that was, uh, that was created during the training phase, and that surely includes some rules, but those might be like grammar or language rules in general also including some, let's say, common knowledge. But there is no easy way of how to, uh, how to check what the model uh, learned during this, during this journey. That's actually one of, the, uh, one of the issues, because there is no way to validate that it really, really was uh, trained properly and can, uh, can um, predict not only the next token, but also uh, factual statements. Mm. And there is also a context that we put into the uh, into the model. So whenever you send a prompt, whenever you query this kind of system, uh, this prompt is being used in order to provide those tokens as a response. And that includes uh, the prompt that you put inside, but if you use an interface like ChatGPT, it also uh, involves putting some uh, previous conversation into the context, but that happens under the hood. You are uh, not really uh, aware of that. But that's something that has to be done in order to include uh, the context of the whole conversation, not only the latest prompt. And the other thing that uh, is a cause of, of hallucinations in large language models is the fact that they see the world as if it was frozen. Uh, that's basically because uh, the training process is, is fairly similar to any different training of neural networks. We need to collect some data and we need to cut it off at some point just to start the training. And that happened for ChatGPT. Uh, the cutoff time for ChatGPT was like September 2021. Uh, so if you ask some questions about uh, anything that happened after, uh, it may be simply struggle with that. And right now, ChatGPT already responds with some uh, like uh, answers that I, I, have this, uh, I have the data set up to September 2021, and if you are asking for the future, I cannot uh, tell you that. But that was like fine-tuned uh, after this, this preview phase. Actually, this, this model uh, uh, gained a lot uh, just because many people started sending those prompts, and they were just able to catch up with all the possible mistakes it might be, might be doing. 
Mm, and this is completely different if we compare to humans. That's why I do not like calling that AI at all. This is like another machine learning system, maybe just a more sophisticated one, but still uh, we cannot... I, I don't want to use the term AI to, to call a system that is uh, trying to predict the next token. That's fairly... Uh, doesn't seem to be justified by, 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 by the fact what I understand as, as intelligence. Uh, so contrary to humans, those large language models do not learn continuously. You might be interacting with them for a while, sending some different prompts into them, and it may seem to remember those facts, but if you just refresh the browser, uh, refresh the page in your browser, uh, you won't be able to retrieve the information that you provided before. And that's, that's in fact because uh, those models are not being trained in real time. That's actually a process that uh, requires lots of computational power. We would need to come back to the slide about the training process, but, but that's basically uh, a matter of uh, days in the best case. And it cannot be done uh, by providing all the prompts because people may be interacting with, with, with those systems in a way that we would never want the, the model to remember. And that's something that we, we cannot expect from, from those models, but I, I just feel that we have some high expectations. Uh, I really recommend reading the article uh, mentioned here. Uh, it's all about uh, our high expectations that we all have for those uh, large language models. But they are actually, that's exactly the same thing. They are trying to predict the next token. So they may be really good at some language tasks, but not necessarily be used as an oracle that we ask and a, and a question and expect to, to receive a correct answer. Uh, really great article, but there is also one lesson to be learned from that. Uh, we cannot expect that, that, that this kind of models to be uh, providing us factual answers, but we can use them in order to solve some language task, because that's in fact something that they were trained for. And those language tasks include rephrasing or summarization, and that's already something that may help us build some, some really cool uh, application based on the large language models. And this is one of the, one of the possible solutions to, to avoid hallucination. In order to, in order to avoid them, uh, we can think about extending the context and rephrasing the task that we want this uh, kind of system to solve. So it's no longer a uh, knowledge uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge task, not knowledge related task, but rather a language task that they should be hopefully able to solve. Because that's something that already happened during the fine tuning process. Uh, some better quality data was used to, to solve this kind, of, this, kind of, uh, this kind of task. So that's basically what we could expect to be working pretty well. And extending the context with some data requires us to possess this information already. So you may ask, What's, what's the reason for including this data if I already have the answer? But that's, in fact, not something that we, uh, we need to have. We only need to have some sort of reliable knowledge base and a way of how to extract some relevant data to be put into our prompt uh, to extend the context. If I ask the following question and put just a, simple para a single paragraph from Wikipedia, uh, I just ask the same question, this is at the end of my prompt, and put a single, that's actually the first uh, paragraph of the whole article about Germany, I, I think. Uh, then the task uh, becomes way easier, because right now the model can simply use the provided information uh, to somehow summarize and answer my question by extracting a single piece of information that I wanted it to. But there are some limits, of course. I cannot put like whole Wikipedia into, into a, every single prompt. Some say it should be possible to put even your whole knowledge, uh, whole knowledge base if you work in a small company. Uh, but those models, uh, and I might be wrong here because uh, I couldn't find a reliable source for that information, but I just found, found some, uh, some comments on some forums. Like there is a limit of tokens, and this is the number of tokens you can provide into a single prompt of ChatGPT. Uh, like model. So that means uh, it's not like a, a single token doesn't mean a single word. So it's even less if you count words. 
and it's quite hard to predict how many words you can put because that's language dependent. Um, but that's bas that, that basically means that we not only need to provide some, uh, some uh, relevant information into our prompts, but we also need to like, extract only those, uh, those pieces which might be relevant. And that's a challenge that we, are all, we were trying to solve for ages so far. It's a problem of search and how to, how to handle that in those new circumstances. Uh, there are some attempts to extend those context windows. Anthropic model uh, claims to support 100,000 context, uh, context windows, which seem to be uh, quite, quite huge. But if you work in, a, in any company that has, um, I don't know, Slack, uh, some confluence or a different uh, or notion or a different system that you use to, to, to like, uh, share the knowledge, share the internal knowledge and how to of, of your company, then if you just calculate all those texts, uh, combine all those texts together and calculate the, the length of them, it will simply turn out to be not enough. And there are some other issues that we have with those uh, huge context windows. Uh, for example, uh, if we just increase the, the context uh, window, we can actually pass some more data. So this is pretty useful. But we still need to know what to put inside a single prompt. So we are not solving the problem of, of searching. We, we still need to find those relevant documents and put, put them inside our prompt. We can just include some more examples. Instead of putting just three, we, we, we can maybe put, I don't know, 100. But still, there is a limit, which is obviously a little bit higher. Mm. That's, that's another point. We need to know what to put inside. Uh, another problem that we cannot really expect uh, our knowledge base to be limited even to that high amount of, of possible documents. And this is pretty damn expensive. If you want to use those, uh, those models, uh, you usually pay based on, on token that you used in, in your prompts. So if you, for every single query, you would be putting uh, like 100,000 uh, tokens, uh, then every single call to that API would cost you about a dollar, if I remember that properly. So that's basically not something that you could afford in the long term if you support every single user query on your, on your system using LLMs. But that also takes a lot of time, passing those data into the, into the prompts and sending in over some communication channel like HTTP definitely need more time than just passing, like, I, I don't know, 100 a uh, hundred characters or even a thousand. So there is a solution that, that many people claim to be right now the only one of how to overcome those, those problems, and this is retrieval uh, augmented language models. Uh, this is basically an extension of large language models. We are still using them, but uh, we support this uh, prompt uh, formulation with putting some additional context uh, in an automated way. Uh, so for that, we need to have a reliable search system. And in this case, that has to be a semantic search, because keyword-based search doesn't apply that well. Uh, I, but I will just try to describe it uh, further on. Uh, so what I mean when I speak about semantic search? Basically, we are using deep neural uh, models, which are capable of, of encoding any type of data into some uh, fixed dimensional vectors. And those vectors have uh, this... Uh, great uh, ability to be close to each other if they represent a similar concept. So if you just put uh, two different pieces of text by describing the same idea, uh, you may expect that the vectors produced by such a neural network will be, will be close to each other in some way. We usually calculate this distance based on cosine distance or dot product, but there are a variety of, op there's a variety of options available. Um, but 90% of the times we are, using, uh, we are using cosine distance. So this is basically, basically it. So semantic search is all about uh, comparing the vectors, but comparing the vectors on, uh, on a really high scale. Because your knowledge base may be built with uh, thousands of documents, and if you, want to, uh, if you want to do it, you need to have a, have a proper tooling. So basically, semantic search is really important uh, to add to create those retrieval-based, uh, retrieval-augmented language models. And semantic search is a capability of, uh, ability of, of deep neural uh, networks to encode uh, 
different texts describing the same idea to the vector spares, space in which those vectors will be close to each other. As is, is in that example, striped blue shirt made from cotton is exactly the same thing like maritime, uh, cotton made maritime shirt. So that's basically the, uh, the idea that, uh, that somebody had in mind while creating this query was exactly the same. Uh, they just described it differently. And we can use that for our advantage uh, because that can already capture some uh, different queries, even though some, some words were not used in our, in our document. So this is basically it. The semantic search in, oppos uh, in opposite to keyword-based search can already handle some synonyms and multi uh, many languages at the same time. Uh, there are some uh, pre-trained models available, also uh, provided as uh, APIs by OpenAI or Cohere, but there are plenty of, uh, plenty of companies offering this kind of, uh, this kind of system. So you don't necessarily need to train your own models, but you can always fine tune the existing ones so they reflect your uh, knowledge in a better way. Mm. And in order to serve vector search in production, you need to use some sort of vector database. And Quadrant is one of, uh, one of the possible solutions. It's uh, written in Rust and mostly focuses on, on the performance. Uh, there are various ways of how to interact with it. Um, you can run it on a single machine for the development purposes, but you can also seamlessly switch to cluster if you want to. And there are also some additional filtering, filters uh, possible to be applied on top of vector search. So let's say you are looking for a piece of cloth uh, similar uh, to the one which is presented on an image. But in addition to that, you also want it to be on a sp in, uh, in a specific color or from a specific fabric. That can be also done and that cannot be easily captured by the vectors. So you need some additional uh, filters to be also applicable. And this is how the interaction with large language models uh, look like without the retrieval argumentation. We, ju we just send a prompt, and this is directly sent into the large language models. And it's up to you if you want to put some additional context or if you do not have any, any idea of what should be put into it. And you may expect uh, the large language model to be, to be just hallucinating if you do not provide it. But if we just decide to extend the system to include this retrieval phase, uh, we need another two components. So we need an embedding model that will be converting our prompts, our queries, into the vector representation. So you are free to choose whatever works for you. There's, there is a huge room for experiments. And you need a knowledge base. And vector database, such as Quadrant, may play a role of this knowledge base, because it may be indexing the vectors for your documents. And those vectors might be then used to extract some relevant documents uh, while, w whenever a new prompt is being sent. So then, uh, when our user sends a prompt, it is being enriched with some uh, relevant information, which is being sent along with the original query into the large language model. This is actually a pipeline that is being implemented in many different libraries that are uh, becoming more and more popular nowadays. Uh, but you can also do it on your own. That's not that fancy um, and not that complicated to be, to be implemented. So how do we build this knowledge base? This is actually uh, something that requires some, some processes, some offline processes. So you can uh, index all the documents that you have in your organization or, or the documents that you would like to use. And those might include some private data that by any means, couldn't be included into the, into the training phase, even this, this first round. Uh, we divide some longer documents into chunks, and those chunks are being vectorized by our, our embedding models, and those vectors are eventually being indexed in the knowledge base along with the text that uh, were used to, to produce the vectors. So then, whenever we receive a prompt, uh, we can ask for some relevant candidate documents and include them into the prompt. And we typically set a limit that we want k uh, closest documents, k uh, most relevant documents which are available uh, for our prompt. But it doesn't seem to be solving all the issues that we have with, uh, with hallucinations and uh, large language models. Um, there is still something else that we need to do, and th th this is all about prompt engineering. I really like the term. Uh, we are right now trying to find the people who are capable of 
talking to our oracles that we created before. That, that's exactly what, uh, what may happen if you just ask a re really simple question uh, to ChatGPT. I asked for some countries which names start with R. And this is a response. I expect that five countries, and uh, the thing to know, there are only three countries uh, on the whole world which names start with uh, letter R. But because I asked for five, a uh, model uh, wanted to just, just make me happy uh, because it was trained to reward uh, proper answers. And that was like the task. I wanted five answers, so it provided five. And that, that's an issue because uh, I may be just thinking that this is a correct answer if I just include it in my pipelines, if I would be directly using those, uh, those responses uh, for some further processing, I would just uh, be relying on some fake information. Um, however, if I just allow the model to uh, just provide me some, some uh, um, like a shorter list, if there are not enough, uh, not enough uh, data, not, not enough information, it changes its mind and tries to, re to replace those uh, obviously long, uh, long entries, like Qatar in the previous slide, with some republics, which is right to some extent, but still there are plenty of republics around the world, and that's not exactly something I wanted it to produce. Uh, so I also need to exclude those republics. I need to know how the model behaves in some specific cases, and I just need to make sure that it won't be making that mistake. And finally, if I formulate my prompt in that way, uh, it is able to produce me a list of results which are not only uh, fulfilling my criteria, like I wanted five, but they are also uh, true. And that's something that we still need to, uh, still need to learn, how to uh, provide the prompts in order to, to be able to retrieve only uh, factual information from our models. So prompt engineering uh, is, is hard, I have to say. I was trying to, to figure out some different ways, and. Uh, there are some cases in which you, you, you would be expecting the model to answer properly to your, to your queries, but it's not the case. We still need to experiment a little bit, and if you just change your large language model, let's say you were dealing with LLMs uh, for a while, you were experimenting with ChatGPT, and then you switch to, I don't know, Llama, then it turns out that you need to learn that from, from the very beginning because the, the prompts have to be formulated differently. That happens if you just experiment with different, different models. But first of all, we need to allow our models to no, not provide the answer if they do not uh, know it. And that's exactly what we need to put into the prompt, because they were rewarded to provide the answer, so there is no reason why they would uh, be uh, answering uh, that they don't know it. And that's the, something that we need to include. But you also need to um, be sure that, that the reasoning scheme of our models is, is, uh, is uh, correct. So that's something that, that's a strategy that is quite common nowadays, asking for a reasoning scheme. And that if you include this kind, of, this kind of request into your prompt, you would be able to track step by step how the, how the model was, was uh, retrieving that, that, that information. At least you might expect it to, to, be, to be returning that information because it might be still hallucinating on the reasoning scheme. So, but that's not something that we can, we can avoid in, in all the cases. Uh, but the most important, uh, important thing is to turn the knowledge-based uh, knowledge task, knowledge-oriented uh, prompt, into a language task. So summarization or rephrasing of the, of the documents seem to be a way of how to overcome those problems. And uh, it's also great to, to expect the model, to include that in, in our prompt, uh, to expect the model to return the sources if you just provide and documents into the into the context, then you may simply uh, simply expect it to to return I don't know some sort of identifiers or, or a number of the document that it used to produce the answer. But there are still lots of challenges. How to keep our knowledge base up to date? Because because uh, this is not fixed and and uh, many events happen uh, every single day. So we need to make sure that we have a process that can back up the knowledge base and, uh, and uh, provide the relevant information as, as soon as it uh, has to be provided. 
um, we only also need to uh, have some other other constraints being applied on top of vector search. If you ask it for the president of US and the cutoff was uh, was done in September 2021, then it might be just simply wrong. But even though if you have a database and you have all the information about the uh, past presidents of US, if you just put all the all those data into the into the prompt, it might be just choosing uh, either of them. Uh, so we need to have some additional constraints apply on top, and that strongly depends on the use case. Uh, one thing to note, quality assurance with, with uh, LLMs is not that easy. Uh, there is like another process that people try to solve with another model being included in that whole pipeline. Uh, so a, a different model is just uh, verifying the, the answers of, of the large language models. Uh, but still, we do not have any, any, uh, any way of how to do that properly. That's really tough. Uh, when it comes to tools which are uh, can be used for that, uh, the most popular one uh, nowadays is Langchain. But if you have worked with Langchain, then you, you may know that they are trying to be really up to date with all the recent uh, updates in large language models. But it comes with a cost. It's quite hard to maintain a Langchain application because of the re release cycle is so fast that they try to release a new version every single day. And if you work with open source, you know that that should require some more effort to like test the things thoroughly and just make sure that they, they do not break uh, anything that is already working based on that, those libraries. But high stack and Llama index seem to be uh, better alternatives. They are more mature projects so to say, and they try to keep the release cycle at some, at some, um, in a proper way at some, some high levels so, so of, uh, of uh, quality. So that's definitely something I would recommend using. But if you have any questions, I hope we still have a few minutes for them. If not, then this QR code will uh, direct to my uh, LinkedIn profile. Please just feel free to drop a message anytime. And here are my socials. So thanks so much for your presentation. It was a bit daunting to get here, but uh, you did very, very well. So I think there would be some questions. Who has some questions for Lucas about this? It seems to be all clear. Ah. I have two questions. Um, thanks for the presentation and for overcoming the challenges. Um, so my question is around, uh, have you ever tried or heard of this uh, option of doing the retrieval afterwards? So basically, I'm asking a rather vague question. I get a response back that, you know, hopefully has some truth in it and then just search for those truths and verify if they actually are in our retrieval system. Well, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, that sounds like something that, that might be possibly one of the ways of how to like, uh, make sure that the quality of the responses is, is, is cool. Uh, I'm not really sure. I haven't, I haven't used that so far, but that's a cool idea. I would definitely try it out. Okay, because I just want to follow up a little bit. Because um, my problem is that probably my questions would be too vague to actually search in the database in the first place. So I want it to be expanded first before I search. Yeah, that may work. I would definitely <coughs> love to hear more about the, the use case you are trying to solve. Because if the queries are that limited, then, then uh -huh. that, that might be great to, to just understand. Maybe you just need a different retrieval process under the hood as well, if, if the questions are, I don't know. Uh, the semantic search uh, works great with retrieval uh, argumentation language models just because those, those queries which are uh, being used are more on the long tail side. So, so they are pretty long. Uh, they may include some keywords, but they come from the natural language. So, so the semantic search works way better than, than keyword-based search. But maybe we can think about having some hybrid or even a keyword-based search if that works in a specific case. It really depends on the use case, but I would love to, to hear more about what we are trying to solve. Cool. Thank you very much.